Today, I want to continue in a series that we have been looking at for discipleship. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details we have over the last few weeks. I would encourage you to go to the church app, again, Solid Rock Church MN, and download the, the last couple of messages under Vision 2024, where we're headed as a church, laying, a, again, a solid foundation of you as a believer, myself, the responsibilities that we have as the light and salt wherever we are. We're going to be doing some training, as you see in your bulletin coming up in March, about sharing your story. And really, this is the core. You have a unique story that God has given to you of what he's done in your life. How you came to Christ made the most important decision you've ever made. And we're going to be having some training of how you can effectively and efficiently share that story with someone in about a minute, a little over a minute, and how you even break the ice to where they want to hear it. There's an anticipation and an expectation that you're going to be sharing something with them, and they're going to want that. And if they, if they don't, an easy way out. But many times when you think of witnessing and going door to door, and there's a place for that, or doing a survey, you know, getting spiritual uh, temperature of where a person may be and leads into another area, all of those things are fine and good, but we're going to be looking at how just to break the ice in a basic conversation. If you're standing in a line, anybody here ever have to wait in line for your groceries or to check out or uh, anything like that? Or if you stop at a rest area and you're out walking around your vehicle and there's people standing around, of how you can walk up to them, you can break the ice and under three minutes you could have a brief presentation of the gospel and they're going to want to listen to it. And so we're going to be having that training. It'll be after the service. I would love every single person to go through that. And you'll be working on it, practicing with one another, honing those skills. And then there's a, uh, a challenge that we're going to do along with this. And uh, again, It'll be after the service. We'll have a meal provided for you. Invite others to come and be a part of it. This is really the core, the center of part of where we're headed this next year to really strip away some of the things and streamline what God wants us to do. After someone comes to Christ, there are a variety of different ways to be able to disciple an individual. By that, we mean to see them grow spiritually in their walk with the Lord. And there's many different things, but what, we're, what I want to do, in, and I've almost gotten through all the lessons, they need to be recorded and they'll be put on the church app, where if you're in uh, California on vacation and you share your story with someone, you lead them to Christ, now it's like, well, now what do I do? You're responsible for them to see them grow in their walk with Christ. Well, you'll be able to just give them a church card. They'll have the opportunity to go on the church website under like new believers classes and they can just follow through one, two, three, four, five, six, laying again a solid foundation of what happened to them and now how do I grow as a believer? Just some basic simple lessons. And what I'm doing a couple of weeks ago and will continue for the next few weeks is to take you through those lessons so that you know what's available to individuals. Now, what I share with you here will probably have a little bit more detail than what it will online. They'll be a little bit more concise. And the goal is for you to walk with a person through each one of those. And if you don't have that opportunity, at least give them directions to know where to go so that they can get started with that. And then what do I do after that? When that's done, what's the next step? So it's going back, looking at the foundation of why we're here why God has us entrusted on the earth at this time. And there's so many good things that we could be doing, but are we focusing on the main issue of evangelism and discipleship? And how do we do that and harness technology even to the 21st century? And how do we do all of these things? Uh, which also, just as a reminder, next Sunday we're going to be having a tech meeting. And that doesn't mean that you have to be all, all technologically advanced for this, but... What, it's more of an idea exchange. We're going to be meeting in the prayer room just across the hall here. And if you have some ideas of how we can harness technology to help facilitate ministry. There are certain things that we do now, but I believe there's a lot more, whether through our app, through a website, other means, whether it's social media, ideas and things that you have without bogging us down, but being able to use it to its most, the highest potential. And you may not know how to do all these things, but we still want your ideas. However, 
when we set this is what we plan on doing, we're going to need a lot of help to carry that out. So we're going to be meeting more of an idea exchange along some of those lines next Sunday in the prayer room. If you're not able to make it and you have some great ideas, just let me know and we will um, put those down. So We've been going through. We, first, the first lesson we're looking at is someone would go on the website. It's not up there yet. We still have some things to do with that. But if they would go on there under New Believers classes, the first one is talking about creation, the fall, and salvation. Those brought together. True foundation of how we got to where we are right now. The next one talks about water baptism. We touched on that last week. We've got a baptismal service coming up here uh, in a handful of weeks. So if you haven't been baptized, in water. We believe it's an important step of obedience. Please talk with me. We'll have that uh, coming up. Today, I'm going to talk about something else that's very important to us as believers. If you would open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, Jesus is about ready to leave his disciples. We've mentioned this before as far as what are those last words you want to share with someone. We have the Great Commission uh, in Matthew 28 and in Mark 16. But Jesus tells his disciples something very, very important. Before you go out, before you start sharing this good news, there's something that I really want to be a part of your life. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, it says, now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. So he told them, you have an amazing commission. However, in order to accomplish that, there is a fulfillment of something that needs to happen and take place. I want you to be, he says here, filled. The Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Now, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote the, the book of Acts. And the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts are referring to the same thing. Jesus in Acts 1 is getting ready to ascend to heaven. Anybody remember when, when he was resurrected, ascends to heaven, comes back to this earth, how many days did he walk on this earth before he ascended back to heaven? Forty. Forty days? He ascends to heaven. We're right at the end of the 40 days. And notice in Acts chapter 1, this is what Jesus tells them. Same scenario he ends with in Luke. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. It's interesting. Jesus tells them, remember, John baptized with water. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And, and the disciples, I can just see him. Uh, Jesus, have a question. Question for you. Um, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you coming back to set up your kingdom here? And I, and I can just see Jesus like, uh, come on, come on, guys. We have this conversation. The most important thing, that, that's coming up. That'll happen. But stay focused on what you need to stay focused on. All right? I told you to wait in Jerusalem. You'll be clothed with power. That's what I want you to focus on. And that happens to us many times. It's like the Lord tells us to do something and we start down that road and we get sidetracked with a lot of other things out here that are good. And it's like, oh Lord, help me with this. Help me to accomplish this. And he's like, uh, you need to get back to what I called you to do. And we're trying to get God to answer prayers when we're out here doing our own thing that are good. And he said, no, I've already provided for you on my path and on my plan. So the goal is not to get God to answer the prayers when you're out here doing your own thing, but you to hear his voice so that you get back on track. And that's what he's telling his disciples. That will be accomplished. I'll set up my kingdom one of these days. But you have something to do before that happens and takes place. Verse number 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now that word, you will receive power. Anybody know, remember what language the New Testament was written in? In Greek, in the Old Testament, in 
Hebrew. Now, in Greek, the word for power is where we get our word dynamite. Anybody like dynamite? Blowing things up? All right. I still can't believe they sell Tannerite in stores, but uh, it's a lot of fun. And, um, but he said, you'll receive dynamite, miracle working power. Now, when will you receive that? It's when the Holy Spirit, okay, notice what he says here in that verse again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The King James says, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, the disciples then followed Jesus' instructions. They wait in Jerusalem. It's been 40 days since Jesus has been with them after the resurrection. He's taken up to heaven. Ten days later is the feast of what? Pentecost. The feast of Pentecost Penta 50, which would be 50 days after uh, first fruits when Jesus is resurrected, we now have the Jewish feast of Pentecost. And something happens on Pentecost. That's why there, there are churches, and we would be one that would be referred to as a Pentecostal church, that believe that this event in Acts chapter 2 is still for us today. It is still for every believer. And it's just as important if Jesus told his disciples, I want you to go out and share the good news, but I want you to wait until you're endued with power. It was vitally important that Jesus share that with his disciples. I believe it's vitally important for us today. Now what we're going to look at is this gift. It doesn't save you. Just like baptism in water doesn't save you and doesn't wash your sins away. But it's for a purpose and for a reason. Now I'm going to break this up because I, I don't, sometimes we hurry through things and I don't want to hurry through this. We're going to break this up this week and next week. And next week we're going to look at some of the benefits because people have questions. What good does this do? Why do I need this? Why should this be something operative in my life? And, and if you can't give people reasons, you're like, I don't know. The preacher just said you got you to gotta be filled with the Spirit. I, I don't know what good it does. It must do good. You need to give them some good reasons, some good understanding behind it. And so we'll be looking at that next week. Now, turn to Acts chapter 2. Let's look at the fulfillment of this, of what happened and took place. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. How, how many of them? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So notice they were all, those that were in the upper room, they were all filled. And as a result, it says, they all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now as we go through here, and you can see this also, I want you to notice the Holy Spirit did not do the speaking. The disciples did. The disciples did the speaking and trusted that what they were speaking was what the Spirit of God was enabling. He was giving them the words, those sounds, but the disciples had to be the one to speak them. This is a separate experience from salvation. Look at Acts chapter 8. I'm going to give you several verses, and I encourage you to go home, study them out, read them, research them, meditate on them. If you have questions, I'd love to sit down, give me a call. Acts chapter 8, Philip goes to Samaria. Now, Philip is not one of the apostles. He's a follower of Jesus. He's a disciple, as if you and I should be a disciple of Jesus. And he goes to Samaria. He's actually a deacon that we find earlier on, uh, ele uh, appointed as a deacon. But now he goes to Samaria, and he preaches Christ to them. I encourage you to read the entire chapter of Acts 8. While he's there, supernatural signs, miracles, things are happening and taking place. And there's a guy, Simon the Sorcerer. He, he's into, into the occult, uh, a lot of dark practices that he's involved in. And, and he does supernatural signs under demonic power. 
But he's amazed at the power under which Philip operates through the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how much power Satan has, and he does. You still need to realize, though, sometimes we, we think of putting Satan in a class by himself, and he's not. He's a fallen angel. He's not above angels. He's an angelic being. Well, there is some power there in the spirit realm, but there is no power in comparison to what God has and what the Spirit of God has who wants to operate through you. And that's why greater is he, 1 John says, that's in you than he that's in the world. So are, are we showing that to a lost world, that I have the greater one abiding on the inside of me? Well, he preaches to them, and notice what happens here in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, so they had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Well, why did they send Peter and John? When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. What? They might receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, these people were born again. They were baptized. They were believers, and they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So they're born again believers, yet it says the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. So what happens here, verse 17, then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you, what do you mean? Didn't they receive the Holy Spirit when they were born again? Yes. You're going to see, as you read through Acts, you're going to see two different phrases used. When a person receives Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes into your spirit, brings eternal life. He takes up his residence on the inside of you. All right, you're born again. You have the Holy Spirit. However, we're going to notice here as we go through Acts, so the Samaritans had been born of the Spirit, but they hadn't been filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you'll see there's a different phrase that's used. As Acts, as you go through there, it says, but he had not come upon any of them. They were, there's a difference of being born of the Spirit and having the Spirit of God come upon you for empowerment. One brings you eternal life. The other one brings you empowerment as a believer. Okay? Can I be led of God without being filled with the Spirit? Yes, absolutely, you should be. There are many things. That doesn't take away from you as a Christian in eternal life. However, being filled with the Spirit is an added blessing of power. And as we'll get into next week, there are certain reasons and benefits for it that I don't want to do without. Okay, if someone says, you know, I, I really don't want anything to do with this. I don't understand it. I don't want a part of it. And the Lord will say, fine, that's, that's totally, your, totally your choice. But if you're like me, I want everything that Jesus bought and paid for in redemption for me. And I want it that operative in my life. So we see that it's a, a separate experience. Turn to John chapter 3. Here's where we get the, the phrasing born of the Spirit. Anybody remember Nicodemus? I always think of Nick at night when I, when I remember in John chapter 3 because he comes to Jesus at night. And there's different speculations of, of why he did that. So he comes to Jesus at night. He is a Pharisee. He is a religious leader. He, is, he, should have, he knows the Old Testament. Well, they called it the Scriptures. We call it the Old Testament. Like the back of his hand. He knows all of these things. And he knows Jesus is from God. He said, we know that you're a teacher from God because no one can do the miracles that you're doing except God is with him. But he's got this burning question about heaven and eternal life. And Jesus makes a statement to him that in order to get to see the kingdom of God, you must be what? Born again. And then he's got the question, how do I enter my mother's womb and be born? And Jesus is like, you're missing the point here. All right, I'm talking about something different. Yes, you've had a natural birth of the water, but you have to have a birth of the Spirit. And this is where we pick up with this. Look at John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water, all right, and the Spirit. So he said you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of the water or born of the Spirit. You have to have a natural birth and a spiritual birth. He goes on. 
to say humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So here, a person who is born again has the Spirit of God abiding on the inside of them. All right? So being baptized or filled with the Spirit is spoken of the Spirit coming upon someone. Let me show you that in Acts chapter 10. We saw it in Acts 2 um, and 8. Look at Acts chapter 10. This is with Cornelius. This is like 10 years after the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 10. This is the first non-Jewish person really that the gospel is going out to. Now the Samaritans won't get into it. They weren't a pure bloodline. They, they're, they're a mixed bloodline and had some Jewish um, ancestry in them. But here with Cornelius, it's the first totally non-Jewish person to receive Christ. And Philip, or excuse me, Peter is, is sharing with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, look at verses 44 and 46. While Peter was still speaking these words, notice this, the Holy Spirit did what? Came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, anybody know who those people are? They're the Jewish people, okay? The circumcised believers, they were Jews who had come with Peter were astonished. Why are they astonished? That the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Well, how did they know? I mean, did their eye color change? Did they grow longer hair? I wouldn't be filled with spirit then, I guess, if I had to have long hair. Did they get taller? Did they get shorter? How did they know that they were filled with the Spirit? Verse 46, For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Speaking in tongues and praising God. So, again, when a person is filled, we see that they speak in tongues. That's how Peter knew that they were filled. Let's look at one more example here in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, the first seven verses. This is Paul. While Paulos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? Well, John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, again, we know that baptism follows salvation. It's just that outward identity that I'm choosing to be a disciple of Christ, a testimony to others. So here we see that these believers are born again. They have believed, and they are filled, or excuse me, they're baptized in water. And he goes on uh, to tell them, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. There's that phrase again. Well, what happened when the Holy Spirit came on them? They spoke in tongues, and here it adds, and prophesied. So we have an operation here of the, another one of the utterance gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. So how did they know they were filled? They spoke in tongues. Now notice, they did the speaking again. All of these cases, they did the speaking, not God. They did it, and they weren't forced to speak. But they were trusting that what they were speaking was utterance that came from the Holy Spirit. Now, when we say tongues here, some translate it unknown tongues, okay? Unknown tongues, because it's unknown to the one speaking. You're like, uh, this is getting kind of weird here. So I'm, I'm speaking in tongues that I don't understand and I don't know. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Just hang with me. All of it will come together here in just a few moments. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. Paul is writing this. It is a good thing to know when, when Paul is writing 1 Corinthians, this was like the most immature, most carnal church of any of those that he was dealing with. And they're the ones that operate in the gifts of the Spirit the most. And they were getting their flesh involved with it. And Paul had to write and bring some correction. He said, you're, you're headed in the right direction, but you're getting too much of you involved with this. We've got to bring some clarity. 
And so what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about the gifts of the spirits. Three power, three utterance, and three, um, three power, utterance, and revelation gifts. They operate as the spirit wills. And then he gets into chapter 13, and we'll look at it in a second, that the most important thing he's saying over all of this is your walk of love. All right? If you speak in tongues and you don't have love, not that good. You got to have love. That's the foundation. And then in chapter 14, what he does is he brings some clarity of the operation of these gifts, especially the utterance gifts. Because what's happening, they're bringing it into public, what should have been in personal use, and, and they're, they're getting things confused, and people are coming to church and they're getting confused. So in chapter 14, Paul is showing the difference between operation of being filled with the Spirit in a sense, as a, as a prayer language that I'm praying up to the Lord and worshiping Him, the difference between that, that operates as I will, and an operation of the gift of the Spirit in a public assembly where God is speaking through an individual to a body of believers, that operates as the Holy Spirit wills. And he's saying, you're getting this confused. He said, I, I want to bring some clarity to this. So in chapter 14, he, he lets them know the difference between the two. One for private use, one for public use. And notice what he says here in verse 14. He said, for if I pray in a tongue, and that means an unknown tongue, notice what part of you is praying. My spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. All right? NIV says, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So when you speak in a known tongue, it's your mind speaking and praying. But when your spirit prays, the inner you, the part that receives the life of God, it's in an unknown tongue that your spirit is praying. So notice again, where if I pray in a tongue or an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What good is this? If I don't understand what I'm saying... If I don't get it, if I don't understand and comprehend in my mind, what good is this anyway? That's what we'll get to later, all right? What you're speaking, and let's bring a little clarity here, what you're speaking may be an earthly language that you haven't learned, okay? That could be one option. On the day of Pentecost, we looked at in Acts chapter 2, as they're gathered together, the 120 in the upper room are speaking in other tongues, and there are people who are gathered from all many other nations, other Jews who have gathered from many other nations, speaking other languages, and they've come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And they hear what's going on with these disciples, and, and it's strange to them of what has happened. They're hearing all of these things being spoken, and they have questions about it. Now, notice, let's pick up with this. Go back to Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. These were earthly languages that the disciples were speaking that were not known to them, but they were known to those who were gathering in Jerusalem. Verse 5. Now, when, now, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, that's them speaking in tongues, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? And then they list the different languages and the places that they're from. Now skip down to the end of verse 11. He's, they said, We're, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. We're hearing them declare the wonders of God. So if I'm Peter that day, I am speaking out in a language that I don't know, but it's another earthly language that someone from that nation has gathered to Jerusalem, and they're hearing me speak the wonderful works of God. And the people from the other nations are like, I know Peter doesn't know my language where I'm from. How in the world? I mean, did, did he take Rosetta Stone? What, what's going on here? I mean, is this guy learning, you know, going to work, walking to work with his, with his you know, earphones on, his earbuds, listening to an, uh, an MP3 file on how to learn 
Parthian or the language that I know? No. It was a supernatural demonstration to let these people know of the wonders of God, but also this was a fulfillment of Scripture. And in the midst of all of this, Peter gets up. And here's where the boldness comes on and the power that he just received. He speaks truth to all those that are here. And he said, what you see happening today is a fulfillment of Scripture hundreds of years old back in the book of Joel chapter 2. This, what's happening right now, is a fulfillment of that Scripture. And as a result of this, 3,000 people come to Christ at that one time. Now what happens that gift was not done away with. We look at the results of this. The boldness that Peter has to preach, the power with which he's preaching, and 3,000 coming to Christ. This is amazing of what is happening. Now, it may be the unknown tongue, may be another earthly language, or it could be a heavenly language. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Paul is talking about love. Notice what he says here in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in the tongue, some of your Bibles will actually say languages. If I speak in the tongue or languages of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Well, it appears from this that there are earthly languages, tongues of men, but they're also then something different than earthly, which must be heavenly languages, tongues of or languages of angels. And Paul said the potential is there to speak in languages of earth, but also languages of heaven. And does it not just simply stand to reason that if things that we have in this earth are patterned after things that are unseen in the spirit realm, and there are languages here which were confounded back at the Tower of Babel, and I think be, be, God said that there's nothing that would be restrained from them because of the unity and the communication, man, how much more speaking a heavenly language uh, with no limitations like that in unity amongst the body of Christ should nothing be restrained from the body of Christ in a good way when we walk after those things. Anyway, um, what happens here is Paul is saying, I have then the potential to speak in the tongues of angels. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put that in there. And so if there are earthly languages, why could there not be a heavenly language? To me, it's like it makes absolute sense. Of course. Earthly languages are limited in what can be spoken and understand or understood. A heavenly language, I believe, is unlimited. Unlimited in being able to speak and comprehend and understand things. And we'll get into the benefits of that for you as a believer as you pray. That you can tap into that heavenly language. And remember, he said in 1 Corinthians 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit is praying. Remember, but I do not understand what I am saying. Well, how can you speak something you don't understand or don't know what to say? It's like, okay, I get it so far. I got it. So, I mean, so what? I mean, what do I just say? abba dabba do? All right, I didn't understand really a word I said, but, you know, I, that must be it. Or do I just, as some people have, have had others, you know, like repeat the vowels really fast, A-E-I-O-U, 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 you say it fast, yeah, that's it, that's it. Or, you know, I want a Honda or many other things that you can just say it fast enough. It won't make sense. That's it. No, that's man's attempt when they're not sure what to do, when they feel under pressure to try to get someone to speak in tongues. And the problem is, people are seeking tongues. You don't seek that. Tongues is not the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's only the initial physical evidence you have been filled. You're always filled first, and then the speaking comes to show that you've been filled as we saw it in Acts. How did they know? They spoke in tongues. So, but how do I do that? How do I speak in a language I don't know? How do I utter sounds that I can't comprehend? What do, what do I do? Well, it's by faith. Well, what do you mean by faith? How, how does that happen? Well, it varies from individual to individual. For me, 
When I was in, I believe it was probably between middle school, early high school, I had heard about being filled with the Spirit. Grew up most of my life, not all of it, most of my life in the Assembly of God Church. And this wasn't really explained real well to me, but I knew that I wanted this. And I remember being at a camp, a summer camp, and they had a line, all these counselors were, you know, they formed a line, one on each side, and as kids walked through, they're going to lay hands on them. You know, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, come forward, we're going to pray for you. And, and so I did. I went through the gauntlet, walked through the line, you know, they're all laying hands on you, you're going back and forth through the, through the line, and you're dizzy enough, but you get at the end. And, and I stood there at the altar, And I hear all kinds of other stuff going on around me. And I'm like, come on, God, okay. I'm ready. I want this, God. Come on, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> Nothing. Didn't feel anything. Didn't. I'm, I'm hoping God, you know, an angel or somebody's grabbing my tongue. Uh, or something. Or God's going to just take me over and I don't know what's going on and all of a sudden woof, there's just flows out of my mouth and I, I can't do anything to stop it and it's like well I know that's God I know it's because I'm not doing anything I'm just I'm just standing here with my mouth open and God's like coming out just I, I know that's God and that's what I'm expecting nothing happened nothing happened so I, I'm discouraged because it looks like other people are getting filled and because I heard them say weird stuff I mean, nothing with me. So I go home. I'm discouraged about it. Kind of forget about it. And from time to time, I'd be praying, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready. Whenever, whenever you want me to, you know, you fill me and, and I'll speak. And I'm expecting God to do all the work. I'm just going to be sitting here, nothing. And one night I'm in bed. And it just kept stirring in the inside of me. I'm laying in bed. I'm in the basement. And no one's down there. My, my sister's here. She'd sleep upstairs. My brother, he'd sleep upstairs. I'm downstairs all by myself. It's dark. No one's down there. And I'm like, okay, God. I, I, I had the, enough common sense to think, what I'm doing is just not working. And I believe you want me filled with the Spirit more than I want to be filled. And if it was going to come the way I'm thinking, standing there with my mouth open and you grabbing my tongue or forcefully having me say something, it would have happened by now. Because it was quite a long time, probably a few years from camp until till now. And I'd struggled in between. And I'm laying in bed and I said, I, I know you'd rather have me step out and make some mistakes and learn from it than never step out at all. So I, I almost felt, I didn't you know, should I say this? I said, God, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start speaking in tongues. And it almost sounded kind of weird coming out of my mouth because I'm thinking in my head, I don't know how to do that. I, but I've heard, I've heard some people at church say it. And there, there was one lady, I could memorize her words because she'd say the same words. She, like in church, give a message in tongues and someone would interpret. And she'd always use some of the same words. So I'm thinking, I could just hijack some of the words she's saying. I could just say those, you know. And then I could, and it was, I can sort of, Atticacy, Atticacy, Antiacacy, is what she would say. I tell you what she said, even to this day, I remember that. She said over and over and over and over. Wonderful woman of God. And I'm thinking, God, I could say that. And then I felt bad. It's like, I can't just say that. You know, and, and so I'm in this little quandary and finally I'm trying, and see the problem is right here. I'm trying to figure it all out with my head and I have to bypass it somehow. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna lay here and I'm just gonna worship you for a few minutes in English and then I'm gonna stop and I'm just gonna start speaking out. Whatever comes out, I'm just gonna start speaking out, but I'm not speaking in English anymore. And so I worship the Lord and I quit in English and I just, I made myself speak. Okay, now this might sound sacrilegious to some, but I'm not, I, I didn't think about what I was gonna say. I just started to, I just made myself speak because I know God's not gonna do this. Once I, it, that's like, it pushed me over the hump. Because once I did that, once I took that step of faith and I just begin to speak and not in English, 
Then what happened, it's almost like the Holy Spirit took hold together with me and just began, and other things started coming out. And, and I, I, these sounds started coming out, and I didn't know what I was saying. And I, and I stopped after probably about five minutes, and it's like the, my mind's telling me one thing. My mind is telling me, you idiot. You, you sound like a little baby babbling. That is so goofy. Well, that was the first indication that I knew I was probably on the right track. Okay? Otherwise, the enemy's probably not going to bother me with that. He would have said, yep, you got it. That's, you just do it. You just keep saying Auntie A E, and you got it. All right? And I knew that I had, had I, I knew it was not me doing this because then the Lord's, I could tell they just spoke to my heart and said, now, were you making up those sounds and that you were thinking about them with your head and with your mind and then saying them like you would in English? It runs through your mind out of your mouth. And it's like, no, I, I wasn't thinking of anything I was saying. It just started coming out when I took that step of faith. And it was, a, again, for me, it helped me understand and realize, yeah, that was, I, I started that, and I didn't have any overwhelming, awesome feeling at the time. It was just a step of faith. You might have some amazing feeling, a sense of presence of God, and you might not. My, my wife's was totally different. When she was, when she was filled with the Spirit, she'd been born again, and um, I've shared the story before, so I'll, I'll cut to the chase of it, that we were in a park in Sheldon, Iowa, and she, she wanted to know what it sounded like. I'm like, do you just wanna, what I'll do is you just want me, I'll start praying in, in tongues, and because we'll get into this later too, you can pray in the spirit anytime you want. And she's like, yeah, that would be good. She's driving, she had a Bible on her lap. I'm sitting in the passenger seat. We're at this park, Hills Park in Sheldon, Iowa, if you've ever been there. And I'm sitting there, and so I just start praying in tongues. And it's like I could sense, I mean, it literally like the presence of God descended in that car. And I'm sitting there praying in tongues, and I hear this. I had my eyes shut, my eyes open, and I turn and I look, and there's a police officer standing at the, at the window. <laughs> it caught me off guard. I don't see, I don't no. I, <laughs> and uh, it, 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 so I rolled down the window, and uh, he goes, everything all right in here? <laughs> and it's dark, it's like it's after 10 o'clock. And he looks over at Deb, he's like, are you okay? <laughs> and she's got a Bible on her lap. Yeah, we're just faking the whole thing, you know. We're, quick, get that Bible out. We're making up. Get that Bible out, quick. There's a, there's a police officer coming. And, and so he's like, okay. He said, well, I just want you to know the park closes at 10. You're going to have to leave. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So I roll the window up, and I look over, and my eye, wife's eyes are like this. Not because of the police officer, but she's like, did you... Did you feel that? And I go, well, like what? He's like, just the, like the, the presence of God filled that car. And she said, I, I almost, I had, to, I had to hold back from not speaking in tongues and letting something come out. I mean, for her, it was like just this, whoosh, an overwhelming sense to speak something out. For me, I had to take that step myself. She would still have to speak it out, but there was a strong urge to do that. For me, there wasn't anything at all, nothing. I just had to do it. So we went to a different park that didn't close at 10. <laughs> right across from the Assembly of God Church, Parkview Assembly. And so we're in the little, the dry one, I'm parking one of the parking spots, and I'm like, okay, let's do this again. All right, I'm just going to start praying in other tongues. And so I did, same, whew, that presence of God. And I said, okay, now you just, just step out. And she just, boom, instantly. And she spoke in tongues, sang in tongues all the way home. I don't know for how long after that, four days? No. She's all the way home. <laughs> and uh, So for her, there was, I mean, a literal, physical sense of the presence of God. And it was, she had to hold back from not speaking. Sometimes that happens. For me, it was just the opposite. So we have to remember, this is not based on feeling or sensation, but it is a gift that God has provided for each and every one of us.